Two days after buying their perfect new home, the Broaders family received a threatening anonymous letter in their mailbox, warning them that they were being watched. This so-called watcher had devoted their life to stalking the home, and now the Broaders family who lived there. Somehow the watcher knew all of their names, all of their ages, and they watched them going about their daily activities and would write to them letting them know that they had been there to see it all. What should have been the perfect start to family life was now shattered with the looming knowledge that they were never quite alone in their own home. Thank God it's Freaky Friday. It's time to dig into the mystery of the Watcher. Before we get into this Freaky Friday episode, I wanna thank our sponsor for making this video possible, Magellan TV. You guys already know our bestie Magellan TV is the best documentary streaming service around. If you're a fan of my channel, no doubt you will be a fan of Magellan TV as well. And I wanted to let you all know about this documentary I watched on there the other day. It was a two part documentary on cults. And guys, it was mental. Cause I don't actually know that much about different cults. Obviously my realm is a bit more like murders. And this series went into like all the, all the big main ones that I guess we've all kind of heard of, like Scientology. But there were also a bunch of smaller ones that I'd never heard of. And they got in like ex-believers, people that had like broken away from the cult to talk about their experiences and kind of how they'd ended up in that situation. And it was just so, Interesting. I feel like I say that about every single Magellan TV documentary, but is that not why we watch documentaries? Because we're interested in the topic. And I really am interested in the topic of cults, especially after watching this series. And I feel like we should probably cover a cult story in this Freaky Friday series. So now we have Magellan TV to thank for me and my researchers going down a bit of a cult rabbit hole for the next few weeks. Magellan are always adding new documentaries to their website. They actually add between 15 and 20 hours of new content every single week. So you're never gonna get bored. And they're very kindly giving you guys a special offer when you click the link down below in the description of this video. So thanks again to Magellan TV for sponsoring and for the special offer. Now quickly before we get into the case, Gonna give my little um, Freaky Friday disclaimer. Can't call it the usual disclaimer, that, that belongs on true crime stuff. But today's video will cover some very sensitive topics, including stalking and threats, so viewer discretion is advised. We make every effort to fact check our sources and make sure that all of the information in these videos is correct, but no action should be taken in reliance upon the information in these videos. All opinions that are about to be stated in this video are mine and mine alone. And with that being said, thank God it's Freaky Friday, let's get into it. So to set the scene, we're in Westfield, New Jersey, which is a cozy little suburb. It's very affluent. The people that live there are very successful. The houses are very nice, expensive, but very nice. And naturally, when you put a load of like successful, wealthy people all in one place, there's a lot of ego, there's a lot of pride, there's a lot of competition. Everyone's always nosy about what other people have. Money, jobs, status, and assets meant a lot to the people in Westfield. But that being said, it was a very lovely place to live. I mean, perfect place to raise a family. And so in June 2014, the Broaders family bought this big, beautiful house at number 657 Boulevard. They planned to renovate it and decorate it and turn it into their dream family home. They couldn't believe how lucky they had gotten with this house. It was on the market for quite cheap. And I mean, the previous family that lived there, they were called the Woods. Family. They'd actually put it on the market at quite a low price point and so there were like bidding wars for this house and the Broaders family won. They paid quite a bit over asking price for it but it seemed worth it. This house was beautiful, it was in a perfect area and they had three young children so they were excited to raise their family. These were their roots. They were, they wanted to invest in the perfect place. And this house especially meant a lot to the mother of the family, Maria, because she had grown up in Westfield. That was her hometown. She'd obviously since moved away, since becoming an adult and she'd had her family. And now she was really eager to move back there and raise her children in the place that she had been raised. In fact, the new house was actually only two blocks away from her house, her childhood home. And she was really excited 
excited to get back there because Westfield had a really good sense of community. It was like everyone in Westfield knew each other and everyone was always looking out for each other. The kind of place where your neighbors are genuinely your friends and not just people that you live next door to. People care for each other, people look after each other. Maria Broadus was an elementary school teacher and her husband, Derek, was the vice president of an insurance firm, which he hadn't always planned to do, but it was quite well paying and hence why the family could afford this really swish house in Westfield. 657 Boulevard set the family back $1.3 million. So it was an investment. And in fact, they were gonna put even more money into it on top of that because the house was quite old. It was built in 1903. Um, and yeah, it needed quite a bit of renovating before they wanted to move in. And because the two of them had three children, the children were like five, eight, and 10 at the time when they bought this house. So they didn't wanna like disrupt the kids and always have builders in and out of the house. So they decided to stay in their old home until the new home was like complete and ready to move into. But the family would regularly visit the new house to go and speak with contractors and you know, decide on like, paint samples and stuff like that. You know, they wanted to oversee the creation of their perfect home. But just three days after closing on the property and becoming the official new owners of this house, the Broadus family found an unassuming white envelope in the mailbox of 657. In fact, I say the Broadus family, but it was actually just Derek that was there that night. It was about 10 p.m. He was there on his own. I think he was just going to pick some stuff up. So he stood there by the mailbox, wondering who the hell had <laughs> sent the mail at this new house already. In fact, he thought it was probably a nice, like, welcoming gesture from one of his new neighbors, a little welcome note or something. I mean, this is a very friendly community-powered neighborhood, so of course he assumed it would be a nice letter. The envelope was handwritten, it was a bit scruffy, and in big chunky letters it said the new owner on the front. And inside the envelope was a typed up letter. The rest of it wasn't in handwriting. And it started out very nicely. It said, dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. But almost immediately after that nice opening sentence, the letter takes a very dark turn. 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father watched in the 60s. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. I see already that you have flooded 657 Boulevard with contractors so that you can destroy the house as it was supposed to be. Bad move. You don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy. So picture this. Derek is at the house all alone, standing outside in the dark. It's 10 p.m. and he is reading this note for the first time. He was horrified. Could you imagine standing outside of your dream home? It's the start of the next big chapter in your life and now you're reading an anonymous letter that tells you that something is lying in the walls of your house. I just can't imagine buying a house and then finding it comes with a stalker included. And there was more to this letter. As Derek kept reading, he became very fearful for his own safety and for the safety of his family because the watcher made it clear that he had been watching them too. The letter said, you have children, I have seen them. So far, I think there are three that I have counted. Do you need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? better for me? Was your old house too small for the growing family? Or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them too to me. So I guess in some cryptic way, the watcher just threatened to kidnap his children. I mean, that's what I got from that. And Derek still has no idea who this person is or what they want from him. They haven't made their intentions clear with this letter other than don't make the house unhappy. The letter finished with, who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard. Maybe I am in one. Look out any of the many windows in 657 Boulevard at all the people who stroll by each day. Maybe I am one. Welcome my friends, welcome. 
Let the party begin. And the letter ended with a signature that was typed in cursive font. It simply said, the Watcher. So Derek finishes reading this letter and he is shaken up beyond belief. He runs straight inside the house, locks all the doors, closes all the blinds, turns off all the lights and everything, and just kind of hides. He called the police straight away and they came down. And as soon as he showed them the note and they read it, all they could say was, what the fuck is this? The detectives had never seen anything like this before. This was just so random and so detailed and so ominous. And I mean, there were genuine threats made, albeit in a very cryptic way, I guess. Uh, like, were they actually threats? I don't know, I think there were threats in there. So the police followed the usual protocol for threats and harassment. They asked Derek if he had any enemies, but he didn't. I guess there was also the fact that they were a very just wealthy, successful family. And naturally those kind of people have haters. They have people that are jealous of them. They have people that want what they have. Maybe it was a secret enemy that Derek never even knew he had, but someone that had been keeping an eye on him. So the police told Derek to clean up all of the construction supplies that were outside the house. Right now there were just like toolboxes out there and stuff. And they said to make sure that all of that is kept locked inside the house, just in case the watcher does want to act on their threats and they use something as a weapon. The police gave Derek as much immediate advice as they possibly could, but they didn't really know what to do. I mean, luckily he didn't live in that house. He now was gonna travel back home to his other house and he was gonna have to show that letter to his wife as well. And she was just as horrified as he was. This was really, really scary. And they agreed not to let the kids know about any of this. They didn't need to know that the family was being stalked. They didn't wanna give them nightmares. Derek and Maria sat up for hours that evening, just reading over the letter, thinking about who it could be, just talking about the whole situation. And they concluded that it was probably just some sick and twisted prank from someone that didn't realize how much this could actually scare someone. It was probably just some like teenagers that didn't understand the implications of sending a threatening letter to someone's mailbox. But there was one part of the letter that was particularly sinister that made them think this couldn't possibly be a prank. The watcher said, I asked the woods to bring me young blood and it looks like they listened. The woods, I don't know if you remember, were the family that the Broadus family bought this house from. They were the last owners of 657 Boulevard. So could this be a clue as to who sent the letter? Did they know anything about this? So Derek wrote an email to them immediately. And when he woke up the next morning, he had a response from Andrea Woods. She said that they actually had heard from the watcher before, but they'd only ever received one letter in the 23 years that they lived at that house. And they received it just a few days before they moved out. But theirs wasn't anywhere near as like scary and ominous as the one that the Broadus family got. The Woods said that theirs was, I don't know, just still weird, <laughs> obviously still weird. The Watcher was telling them how long they'd been watching the house for, but this was the only time they'd ever made contact with the Woodses. When they'd received this letter, they just kind of threw it out. I mean, they weren't too scared by it and plus they were moving out in a few days. So they just tossed it in the bin and forgot about it. But obviously now it had turned into something way bigger. And so the Woods agreed to go down to the police station with the Broadusters the next day um, and tell the police everything that they knew, everything that they could remember from their letter. So they go down to the police station, they have this first official meeting about the Watcher. And at the end, the police tell both the Broadus family and the Woods family not to tell a single soul about these letters, especially none of the new neighbors. No one on the whole of Boulevard should know about these letters from the Watcher. And I mean, at first this kind of took them back a bit because you would think that police would wanna go and question them all and see if any of them had seen or heard anything or if they knew anything about this. But the police reminded them that actually all of their neighbors are suspects right now. It could be any one of them. And I mean, they all have the best vantage points of 657 Boulevard. They literally live right next to it. Those are the perfect people to be able to watch it 24 seven. So just in case any of them were the watcher, police didn't want 
anyone to know that this investigation was going on and that they were looking into it. So the Broadus family go back home that night to their old house and they try to just live life as normal, assured that police were on the case and they were gonna try their best to figure this out. But of course, they were on high alert for weeks after this. What was supposed to be a really nice new chapter in their life, moving into their family home, getting it ready, you know, their, f their forever home was ruined by a creepy stalker that was making threats about kidnapping their children. Every time they would check the mailbox at 657 Boulevard, they were scared stiff that they would find another ominous white envelope in there. And what was even scarier is they didn't know how much the watcher was watching them. Like, did it end at 657 Boulevard or would the watcher follow them home? Did they know where their current house was? Literally nowhere felt safe for the Broadus family anymore. They were living in constant paranoia, constant fear, to the point where Derek actually had to cancel a work trip because he didn't want to leave his family at home alone without him there to protect them just in case. About a week after they received the letter, the Broadus family went back to 657, you know, meeting contractors and stuff like that. And they noticed that the sold sign that was still up outside the house had been ripped up. And of course they feared that it was the watcher striking again, you know, just trying to scare them. They never actually got any proof or confirmation that it was the watcher that had ripped up this sign, but I mean, c c come on. Two weeks after the first letter had arrived, Maria popped down to 657 Boulevard. She was doing paint samples with the decorator and she dared to grab the post from the mailbox while she was there. She shuffled through this short stack of letters and she found a white envelope with that same familiar scrawled handwriting on the front. It seemed that the watcher was back. And so before she even opened this envelope, Maria called the police and got them to come down to read it with her because she was so scared. The letter said, welcome again to your new home at 657 Boulevard. The workers have been busy and I have been watching you unload carfuls of your personal belongings. The dumpster is a nice touch. Have they found what's in the walls yet? In time, they will. Again, horrifying. What is going on within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Like, this has been mentioned twice now, and especially with all the mention of, like, young blood. That's genuinely one of the scariest things I've ever heard. Imagine moving into a house and someone is telling you that something is in your walls, but they won't say what it is. And in this letter, the Watcher had actually addressed Derek and Maria by their actual names. The Watcher knew their names. Well, <laughs> they tried to use their names, but they actually, like, spelled it wrong. They called them Mr. and Mrs. Braddus. Um, so I don't really know what happened there. It's actually surprising that the Watcher managed to get that little fact wrong because they knew so much about this family and they were very, very accurate with it as well. The Watcher wrote about their three children. Uh, they had figured out the age order of the kids and they also knew a bunch of their nicknames. They must have overheard as the family were like calling them or as they were talking to each other. And in this letter, they even singled out one of the daughters asking if she was the artist of the family. And they worked out that the reason the Watcher must have asked this is because she had been painting pictures out on the porch while her parents were inside doing some work. She had been painting a few days ago. And that just sends shivers down my spine. Imagine being a parent and getting that letter that someone had just been watching your daughter doing child things. I don't know, that, oh, it makes me feel sick to my stomach. And the fact that they'd been watching long enough to figure out the names and figure out the ages. This second letter was 10 times longer than the last and honestly, 10 times creepier than the last, if that's even possible. So buckle in, <laughs> I'm gonna read it for you now. 657 Boulevard is anxious for you to move in. It has been years and years since the young blood ruled the hallways of the house. Have you found all of the secrets it holds yet? Will the young blood play in the basement? Or are they too afraid to go down there alone? I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Will they sleep in the attic? Or will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I'll know as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the Watcher 
and I have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move on and they kindly sold it when I asked them to. I pass by many times a day. 657 Boulevard is my job, my life, my obsession. And then the letter finishes with, greed is what brought the past three families to 657 Boulevard and now it has brought you to me. Have a happy moving in day you know I will be watching. You know what, I'm not gonna lie, I was researching this case like late at night one day and I had to stop after I got to that letter because I was like, I am gonna throw up. I don't know how this family didn't go like absolutely insane. Of course, after this second letter, the family avoided going back to 657 Boulevard completely. They only went when they absolutely had to because they just didn't feel safe there anymore at all. I mean, especially that part about like, if the parents were upstairs, you would never hear the kids scream. That is so sick and twisted. That's like the second threat that they have made against the children. Another few weeks of silence followed this second letter. I mean, not that they were really checking the mailbox anyway, because they were too scared to. But then three weeks later, another white envelope appeared. This time it said, where have you gone to? 657 Boulevard is missing you. So again, the family turned the letter over to investigators who were trying their best to figure out where the letters were coming from. They'd managed to track down that they were coming from a post office in Westfield, the closest post office to 657 Boulevard, which they kind of expected, but I mean, at least that confirmed that the watcher lived very close by, I guess. It didn't really narrow it down much at all, especially when they were already suspicious of the neighbors, like the direct neighbors. But the police had figured out that the watcher seemed to have quite a good knowledge of the behind the scenes of the house sale somehow. The first letter was sent on June 4th and the house sale became public the next day. So, how did the watcher know that the house had been sold unless they had like insider knowledge of the sale? Actually, I wonder if contractors had been there before the sale became public. Cause I mean, they had already bought it, it just wasn't public. I don't know, maybe I've just debunked my own little thing there. But I guess that's equally as creepy cause it means that the watcher was watching <laughs> the house and watched the contractors arrive and they must've thought, oh, this means new new people in the house. So detectives went down to the house and they did some like physical tests to see where the best like vantage points of the house are. Cause if someone is like just walking past or standing nearby the house to watch it, then they wanna be able to see where they would probably stand. And they actually realized that the spot where the daughter had been painting on the porch was partially obscured from the street. Meaning that if you wanted to see the porch, you would have to kind of go around the property, onto their grass, onto their garden, and kind of come around the back a little bit. So that means that the watcher is getting closer and closer. I mean, they're literally on the property at that point. Unless maybe they were looking out of like a nearby window, like a second story window. Again, maybe it's the neighbors. Which is where our very first suspects come in, the Langford family that lived next door. Maria and Derek had actually been warned about the Langfords by another neighbor. Well, not exactly warned, but basically they were invited to a neighborhood barbecue before they like fully moved in. I guess it was just a nice gesture from the people on the street. You know, they wanted to get to know their new neighbors and they went along. Partially because, yeah, they wanted to get to know their neighbors, but they also wanted to keep an eye out. They wanted to see if anyone was acting suspicious. They got chatting to a neighbor who lived two houses down from them, and they told Maria and Derek all about the weird Langford family that lived between them. Peggy Langford was the matriarch of the house. She was in her 90s, and a lot of her adult children still lived in that home with her, and they were all like in their 60s. And this neighbor at the barbecue said that one of Peggy's sons in particular, a man named Michael, was especially strange. He described him as a Boo Radley type. If you don't know, Boo Radley is a character from the book To Kill a Mockingbird, and he's a very um, reclusive man. Only ever seems to come out at night. And supposedly Michael Langford had a Boo Radley vibe. Like, he seemed harmless, but he was very unsettling. There was something off about him. Well, immediately, alarm bells start going off for the Broadus family because they were suspicious of their next door neighbors anyway. Maybe he 
wasn't as harmless as he seemed and maybe he had a great view of the porch, good enough to write these creepy fucking letters. I think the fact that he still lived at home in his 60s is even more reason to be suspicious of him because, well, I mean, he's had a good view of 657 Boulevard for 60 damn years now. And the watcher said that it had been in their family for generations. Seems their family had owned that house for a long ass time. And plus, if he was the watcher, why would he move out? <laughs> he has a perfect place to watch from. Derek managed to find out that the Langford family had actually been living next door to 657 since the 1960s. And now this made Michael Derek's number one suspect. So Derek reported back to the investigators, told them everything that he knew, and they agreed that they should probably look into the Langfords. So they called up Michael and asked for him to come down to the police station for an interview. He denied knowing anything about the Watcher letters. He said it certainly wasn't him and he had no idea who it could be. But I mean, like, of course you're gonna say that. Of course you're gonna say, no, no, it wasn't me. Uh, police didn't fully believe him. Um, they thought that he was probably still hiding something. He seemed just quite irritable over the whole thing. Like he was pissed off that he was having to be questioned and stuff. So they thought they were gonna have to try and like coax some information out of him some other way. So they devised a plan. They got the Broadus family to write a letter just to the Langfords, but it was the letter was gonna sound as though it was sent to every neighbor on the street. Basically letting them know that the Broadus family had plans to tear down 657 Boulevard. And they knew that if they got another watcher letter soon saying like, don't tear the house down, then they would know that it was the Langford family because they were the only ones that were getting this letter. So if they reacted, it's them. But this letter didn't <laughs> really do anything. There was no more communication from the watcher and the Langfords as the Langfords didn't say anything about it. They didn't seem to mind. So eventually police asked Michael Langford to come in for another interview and this time he got like properly defensive. The first time he just seemed a bit miffed off that they'd made him come in, but now he was getting like actually angry and his sister Abby was there and she was accusing the police of like harassing her family. But at this point, everyone kind of thought that the watcher was Michael Langford. I mean, even the police, even though they had no evidence, they couldn't technically say that they thought that, but like everyone was a bit like, Come on. I mean, it probably is the next door neighbor, isn't it? So at this point, because they don't have evidence, they can't arrest him, they can't be overly accusatory because it's not going well for them. The Broadus family decided to lawyer up. The Langfords also hired their own lawyer and they all met up to discuss this situation and to hopefully put an end to it. The Broadus family lawyer explained to Michael why he was being suspected. They had a lot of, circumstantial evidence, you know, the vantage points, certain things that you'd only be able to see from his side of the house. Of course, Michael continued to deny every single claim and this meeting also got quite heated. He was, he was just angry at being suspected for this. He kept saying that they don't have any evidence. They don't have any reason to think that it's him just because he lives next door, what, that's coincidental. So this lawyer's meeting ended with kind of no resolution. There was, there was no way to arrest them or to pin anything on them because there really wasn't any evidence in this case whatsoever. But Derek and his family felt very let down by the police. In fact, they were quite mad at the police. They felt like they weren't doing enough. And actually Derek told the police that if they didn't solve this situation for him, then they would have another case on their hands. He said, this person attacked my family and where I'm from, if you do that, you get your ass beat. Because the police couldn't provide the Broadus family with the information that they wanted, the information that they needed to protect their family, Derek decided to start his own investigation. He set up a bunch of security cameras outside 657, kind of secret ones <laughs> that didn't look like cameras. And he spent hours every evening huddled up in the dark, watching the footage of these cameras to see if he could see anyone suspicious, anyone lingering, any cars repeatedly coming by the house. He started officially documenting everything. He had piles and piles of just pages of like copies of the letters, copies of like different things that he'd seen on his security footage. He was putting everything into one giant, physical database, I guess. He had a map of the street and he'd noted down the year in which each family moved into each house. And the only people that had been there since the 1960s 
were the Langfords. Also on this map, he had marked possible sight lines for the easel. You know, when someone saw his daughter painting on the porch, he'd written out like the different places where they could have been stood. Also, he drew like an approximate earshot range you know, because obviously the watcher had heard them saying each other's names. They'd figured out the kids' names. So they must have been close enough to hear. You know what? To someone like me <laughs> that does all this research and stuff, all this evidence collection sounds quite impressive. When I first heard it all, I was like, damn, he really knows how to investigate his own little thing. But the reality of it was people in Derek's life thought he had gone mad. They thought he had lost the plot completely because... To be fair, at this point, some people were still thinking it was some sort of sick prank. They thought he was really losing his mind, and to a degree, he was. He had become obsessed with the Watcher. It was all he thought about. He like struggled to do anything else because all he could think of was how they were gonna catch the Watcher. He even hired a private investigator to come on and help him out. The private investigator like staked out the neighborhood. They were watching to see if they could see anyone suspicious. They also did a load of background checks on all the different neighbors, um, but there was nothing really noteworthy. Everyone was just... <laughs> normal families. So when the PI proved not very useful, he fired them and now he hired a former FBI agent. So he's taken one step up because he really wanted to do like a threat assessment. He wanted to know if he was actually in his right mind for being so scared about this. So this FBI guy comes in and he creates a suspect profile. Uh, uh, he comes up with a bunch of different traits that he thinks the watcher probably has. So he thought it was an older male. Uh, and the reason he thought he was older, and by older, I don't know what he means. <laughs> I don't know if older means like an elderly gentleman or just, I don't know, what does older mean? But basically the reason that they think he was older is because the letters were written in quite an old fashioned kind of way. Just, just the way that he was saying things and he would always mention the weather. I don't know. It, and especially because this was 2014. It, they were kind of giving like letters from the war vibes. It was also interesting that considering how angry these letters sounded, it sounded like the Watcher was miffed off. But despite that, the Watcher never really like swore in these letters. There was no profanity. There wasn't really much name calling and stuff like that. It all seemed a lot more composed and calculated. Maybe this was a very intelligent person that they were dealing with. But I mean, none of this is really helpful, is it? I, it's quite interesting to have a little bit of a suspect profile, but these are just guesses. They're just theories. It's not... It's not helping them find the Watcher really, is it? The FBI guy really didn't feel like the Watcher was likely to act on the threats that he was giving. But one thing that he did notice were, well, that I'm sure you've probably also picked up on, was a real venomous anger towards the wealthy. He said it was greed that brought all the other families to this house and he seems to have a real issue with like new money moving onto the street. He doesn't like all the renovations that are happening to the house. He doesn't like that they're modernizing things and they're taking out the, the original beauty of 657. One of the letters said, the house is crying from all of the pain it is going through. You have changed it and made it so fancy. It cries for the past and what it used to be. By the end of 2014, the investigation stalled. And at this point, the broadest family are exhausted. It had been six months since they received that first letter. So six whole months of just total paranoia and fear. The Watcher had left no trail of evidence at all because of course the letters were typed out, there were no fingerprints, like there was nothing to identify them with. And at this point, the Westfield police just told the Broaders family to try to move on. Like if the Watcher has stopped contacting them, it had been a while since they'd gotten any letters. The police said to just try and move on and, you know, believe that it was a prank. Once the renovations were finished on the house, honestly, the Broadus family couldn't think of anything worse than actually moving into their new home, which is really sad. Aside from all the money that they'd spent and all the work that they'd had done, all the effort that went into it, they were also just heartbroken because they imagined themselves raising their family on that street and it had been ripped away from them by a stranger, a stranger that they couldn't even find. And right when they thought the watcher had eased off, another white envelope appears in the mailbox. 
657 Boulevard is turning on me. It's coming after me. I don't understand why. What spell did you cast on it? It used to be my friend and now it is my enemy. I am in charge of 657 Boulevard. It is not in charge of me. I will fend off its bad things and wait for it to become good again. It will not punish me. I will rise again. I will be patient and wait for this to pass and for you to bring the young blood back to me. 657 Boulevard needs young blood. It needs you. Come back. Let the young blood play again like I once did. Let the young blood sleep in 657 Boulevard. Stop changing it and let it alone. Of course, the Broadus family didn't feel safe going to live in 657, but they'd already sold their current house that they were living in and they needed to move out of there because the new owners wanted it. So they ended up living with Maria's parents for a while. And at this point, the Watcher was causing a lot of conflict within the family. Maria and Derek would argue all the time. She felt like he was going mad. He felt like she wasn't taking it seriously enough. Maria had really bad anxiety. She had to see a therapist. Derek described himself as a depressed wreck. Like this was really tearing their family apart. And they ultimately made the difficult decision to sell the house, sell 657 Boulevard, just give up on that dream and try again somewhere else because this was not worth the hassle. But selling the house was gonna be very tricky because by now, rumors had started to circulate around town as to why this beautiful renovated house had laid empty for so long. Everyone knew that something was wrong. In June 2015, so a whole year after they purchased the house, Derek and Maria filed a legal complaint against the Woods family that sold them the house. They said that the Woods should have disclosed to them that they had received that creepy letter from a stalker three days before they moved out. They said that would have completely influenced whether they wanted to go ahead with the sale, but the Woods kept that information from them, knowing that it would probably change their minds about wanting to live in that house. But the Woods defended themselves saying that their letter that they got wasn't creepy. It wasn't menacing, it wasn't threatening. I mean, I guess the concept of having a watcher of your house is creepy and scary enough on its own, but the tone of their letter wasn't, didn't seem sinister. So yeah, they thought it was just a prank and they threw it away. They didn't think it was anything that they needed to warn the new owners about. The Woods said that their experience of living in that home was perfectly fine. <laughs> they were fine. They, re they lived there for 23 years, remember? They'd never once had a problem. They'd never once been contacted by the Watcher right up until before the Broadus has moved in. Maybe it wasn't a problem with the house. The Broadduses hoped to reach a quiet settlement with the Woods. They really didn't want this story being picked up by the media. They didn't want anything being reported on. Of course, remember their kids don't even know that it's going on because they didn't want to scare them. They just didn't want this to be news. They didn't want to provoke anything. Their lawyer assured them that it probably wouldn't get picked up by the media. If anything, it would probably get picked up by like small, legal news teams, um, but it probably wouldn't be like on front pages of newspapers and stuff. But I think they uh, severely misjudged how fucking scary and interesting <laughs> this story is. Yes, it did get picked up by these little legal teams, but as soon as people read it on those, they started sharing it around and then it soon became a viral story. How can you not read snippets of those letters and not want to tell people about it. I mean, look, and that's exactly what I'm doing now. They freaked me the fuck out and now I need to freak you guys out. So now that this story had gone viral, every news platform wanted to cover it. They were sending news trucks down to the house. They were literally parking outside the house, on the driveway, everything. Derek and Maria received over 300 media requests. Everywhere wanted to talk to them, interview them, get their take on the watcher. The family fled Westfield at this point in time. They went to stay at a friend's beach house until the media circus died down, but Derek and Maria knew that they had to tell the kids at this point. They weren't gonna be able to keep it from them for much longer. Plus, they had a lot of questions. I mean, they were fully aware that they hadn't moved into their new house yet, and they were confused, and they were confused why there were trucks everywhere, and why they'd so suddenly run off to their friend's beach house. And of course, when they did find out, the kids had so many questions, like who the hell was the Watcher? Why was he angry at them? What had they ever done to him? Uh, all questions that their parents couldn't answer because they didn't know either. And now that this case was getting so much public attention, the family were also getting a lot of public 
condemnation. They had a lot of haters, basically. People saying that they were being ridiculous for not moving into this beautiful big home and being put off of their dream family home by a couple of anonymous letters that were probably a prank anyway. People said that they would never let some stupid letters put them off living in such a nice place. And all of this really angered Derek because no one understood. He said none of them had read the letters or had their children threatened by someone they didn't know. And since this case had gone viral now, everyone in Westfield was kind of worried. They didn't know if this posed a threat to anyone else. They didn't, all they knew was that there was a fucking weird, creepy stalker lurking in the depths of their town and no one knew who it was. It was starting to affect the townspeople so much that the mayor actually had to make a public statement saying that the watcher hadn't actually been heard from in over a year at this point, so maybe they'd given up. But regardless, the mayor assured everyone that even though the police had never found the watcher, their investigation into it all had been very thorough and they didn't believe the watcher posed any current risks. But actually, this was the first that a lot of neighbors had heard about this so-called thorough investigation. Because if you remember, police had told the families not to tell any of the neighbors. So the neighbors had no idea that police were actually looking into this for the past year. A group of them came together and wrote a letter to a local newspaper saying, we are confounded as to how a thorough investigation can be conducted without talking to all of the neighbors with proximity to the home. And I guess they have a point. I Once it got this far out and the story became viral, I guess obviously there were reasons to not tell the neighbors in the beginning, but now they knew. So why not interview them? Some of them might have seen something or heard something. So now the police investigation was being scrutinized and they knew they needed to step it up a bit. So they gave the case a shake up, they put some new detectives on it and they were gonna have a look at the, the watcher letters through a fresh lens. And when they did, they actually found some breakthrough evidence. They were testing the envelopes that the letters had come in and they found women's saliva DNA on one of the envelopes. So was the Watcher a woman? This changed everything. <laughs> this means it wasn't Michael Langford. I mean, if the Watcher licked their own envelopes, then it wasn't Michael Langford, but he did have a sister. Remember Abby Langford that got really irate with the police saying that they were harassing her family? Maybe it was her. And Abby actually happened to be a real estate agent. Uh, so maybe that's a potential motive. Maybe she was mad that she lost out on the sale of the house literally next door. It would have been a really big commission. I don't know, maybe there was like a money or career kind of motive there. Or maybe they were trying to get them to move out so that they could like sell the house for them. Or, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Police managed to get a hold of a water bottle from Abby's bin, <laughs> which is nice. Uh, they sent it off to the lab to be tested and it turns out it wasn't her DNA on the envelope. So another Langford was ruled out. Well, actually after this, the prosecutor's office told the Broadus family that they were ruling out the Langford family completely. They wouldn't actually tell the Broadus family how or why they had come to this conclusion, but they said they really didn't believe it was any of the Langfords. But detectives had recently learned something very interesting, and that was that the Broadus family weren't the only house on the street to have received a letter from the watcher. Around the same time that 657 got the first letter, another house just up the street received a very similar one, but just like the Woods family, theirs wasn't like sinister, it didn't have like scary vibes to it. So they just threw it in the bin, they thought it was stupid. No one seems to have taken the watcher quite as seriously as Derek Broadus. And maybe that's why the Broadus family were receiving so many more letters because they were reacting. Like they were giving the watcher what they wanted. But this other letter, that this family up the street had received made the watcher all the more interesting because I don't know, in the letters to 657, he seems so obsessed specifically with the house. He loves the house. They've been watching the house for generations. Well then what, what about, what, what's all that about this other house? What do you mean? Do you watch two houses? To me, that kind of screams that it was a prank. I don't know. I mean, there's still a lot more to talk about and I still don't have a fully formulated opinion on this. But to me, that, seems as though like a group of teenagers had written the same letter a few times and tried different houses with it and just seen which one was the one to buy. But I mean, with all these police investigations, you'd think that it's not a prank. I don't know. The new detectives that were put on the case were trying a bunch of different tactics to try to 
spot the watcher, like physically catch the watcher in the act. They would like sit and park outside the house or like just down the road and they would watch the house at all hours of the night. And on one particular night, they noticed a car drive up in front of 657, park up, stay there for a while and then drive off. So they noted down the license plate, turns out this car belonged to a young woman who was visiting her boyfriend who lived like two blocks away. Police called her down to the station and they were asking her if she knew anything about the watcher, if she knew who it was. And she said she didn't know anything about the letters, but she had heard of the watcher before. She said that her boyfriend plays this really scary video game where you play as someone called the watcher. So now, police are kind of interested in this boyfriend as well, because what if the watcher wasn't just one person? What if it was multiple? Maybe two people, maybe a couple. That would kind of explain the female DNA on the envelope and maybe this girl was sent to look at the house by her boyfriend and then maybe she would go back home and they would write the letters together. Who knows? It's becoming a really big theory for something so little that she literally parked up her car for like a minute in front of the house. Police got in contact with the gamer boyfriend and they asked him to come down for an interview. He agreed to it but never should. So they called him again and they said, hey, come down for that interview, please. And he said, yeah, okay, never showed again. And from that point, they stopped being able to get in contact with him. So who knows? I don't know. And that's where that theory ends. So I don't know. I think it is a little bit far-fetched until you get to the part where he ghosts the police. And then I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait, why? Why are you doing that? At this point, they had picked up so many leads and found so many dead ends that people in Westfield started to accuse the Broaders family of making the whole thing up. Maybe they had written the letters to themselves and then pretended to have received them. Maybe they wanted out of that house somehow. Maybe they had like buyer's remorse, you know, where you buy something really expensive and then suddenly regret it. And maybe they wanted the house, I don't know, like taking off their hands. It makes sense because they're blaming the Woods family for all of this. Hmm, maybe they're trying to conduct some like elaborate scheme to get money back on the house, like claiming that it has this issue, this stalker that comes attached to it and the woods never told them about it. Meanwhile, the stalker maybe doesn't exist. I don't know. Guys, just a reminder, all opinions in this video are mine and mine alone and it's all alleged. <laughs> just, just wanna let you know that. Cause to be fair, people had been wondering in Westfield for quite a while why this family was still going on about the watcher when they hadn't heard from him in so long there had been no letters plus they keep renovating this house despite being so terrified of these letters that were genuinely threatening to kidnap and hurt their children i mean there is a reason to be upset by these letters and terrified of them but why are you still renovating that house if if i got one letter threatening to kidnap my children, I'd be out of there. There ain't there no chance I'm living in that house. Some people even speculated that they were doing it all for a movie deal. Like maybe they had written themselves all these letters. You know, it's, it's giving like a uh, Amity, Amityville horror house or something, what's it called? Can't find my phone, Amityville. Okay, going on a bit of a tangent, but I have just Googled <laughs> the Amityville horror thing. Turns out it was a real true crime case. A load of people were murdered in that house, but then the hauntings afterwards are up for debate. Um, and people think that that was just for a movie deal, that the family that were living in there were like lying about all these supernatural happenings. Anyway, <laughs> back to the watcher. So yeah, people are accusing the Broadus family of orchestrating all of this. So at one point, police actually test Maria Broadus's DNA, saliva DNA, and the daughters of the family. None of them were a match. None of them had sent the envelope. There was equally as little evidence for the Broadus family being the watcher as there was for anyone else. There was, there was just no evidence in this case whatsoever. I imagine it was so frustrating. Derek believes that the local people tried to pin this on them because that was just easier than admitting that something actually very scary is going on in their happy, safe neighborhood. Something that no one had any control over. Something that the police seemed powerless to fight. Like it was scary. So maybe people were trying to come up with a less scary explanation for it all. Throughout all of this, over the past couple of years, the Broadus family had become not only outcast from their own home, but pretty much outcast from Westfield as a whole because now everyone was side-eyeing them because they're the family that 
may or may not have orchestrated the Watcher. And Westfield, as I've already mentioned, gets a, like a little bit uh, clicky. Is that the word to use? There's a lot of gossip, a lot of drama, a lot of, you know, like suburban drama. And I think the next story really highlights this. Um, so every year they have a gingerbread house making competition and shit gets elaborate <laughs> in this competition. People make fucking fortresses of gingerbread. So in this particular year, the gingerbread competition happens and first place in the iconic buildings category went to a gingerbread rendition of 657 Boulevard. And the attention to detail was insane. It even had like letters, envelopes from the watcher on the porch made out of gingerbread. Which I know it's probably not that deep at all to the rest of the people in the town, especially the people that think it's a prank or think it was orchestrated. But to Derek and Maria, who insist that this was all real, they were heartbroken that people were treating their stress, their trauma, their very real experience um, as a joke, as an urban legend or like folklore, something that didn't actually happen, but to them, it really did. And they never felt like anyone took them seriously. They were just a joke to be made with the gingerbread house. But even though people had kind of stopped believing the broadest family a little bit, they were still struggling to sell that house and still no one wanted it. It was getting a lot of interest. A lot of people would like click it on right move or whatever. I don't know what the American version of that is, like real estate websites. Uh, people would click it and they would think, wow, what a beautiful house. But the more research they would do, they would find the watcher story, they would read the letters and they would think, Fuck that. They had so many people show interest and then back out, show interest and then back out. And at this point, Maria and Derek felt like they were never gonna sell this house. And so they were trying to come up with other ways in which they could maybe try and get their money back from this situation so they could invest it into a new family home. So they eventually decided to sell the property and the lot of land to a developer so that they could knock down 657 Boulevard and turn it into two houses. They reckoned that they could get about a million dollars for the lot. So they, they would be taking a loss, a 300,000 pound loss thousand dollar loss. But there was just one thing holding them back from going through with this plan and that was that they needed like planning permission from the council to be able to knock down the house and put two up in its place. So a whole board meeting had to be held with members of the council and like town officials. Do they call it the council in America? I don't know, like the mayor had to be there, I guess. Uh, and a bunch of neighbors came. And the neighbors were like weirdly passionate about not wanting this house to be knocked down, even though it doesn't really have anything to do with them. They just walk past it every day, but for some reason they were, they really didn't want it to happen. One of them actually hired a lawyer to bring along to the meeting. Like, why do you? Why do you care? It's just so dramatic. And for what? Like this meeting went on for four hours. It got really, really heated. And then at the end of it, the board unanimously rejected the proposal. Derek and Maria were back at square one, still with this fucking haunted house or whatever. Finally, the Broadus family got some good news when they found a family that were willing to rent the house off of them. They didn't wanna buy it. They would rent the house on one condition and that's that they could get out at any time if another letter arrived. Cause like I say, it had been quite a while since the last watcher letter. So this family thought they were probably safe to live there, but they needed that clause in the contract just in case. But two weeks after this new family moved in, Derek went down there to go and sort out like some squirrels that were living on the roof or some shit like that. And the new tenant handed over a white envelope with scrawled writing on the front. Two and a half years after the watcher's first letter to the Broadus family, it seemed they had struck again. Uh, had they ever really left? Violent winds and bitter cold to the vile and spiteful Derek and his wench of a wife, Maria. You wonder who the watcher is? Turn around, idiots. Maybe you even spoke to me, one of the so-called neighbors who has no idea who the watcher could be. Or maybe you do know and are too scared to tell anyone. Good move. 657 Boulevard survived your attempted assault and stood strong with its army of supporters barricading its gates. My soldiers of the Boulevard followed my orders to a T. They carried out their mission and saved the soul of 657 Boulevard with my orders. 
all hail the watcher which is a terrifying way to sign off the letter. Up until this point, it had just been the Watcher in like cursive writing, but now it was giving like cult leader, especially with all the mention of what their soldiers, what were they calling him? My soldiers of the boulevard followed my orders to a T. Who? The neighbors. Does this mean that all of the neighbors of this street were all in on this together? So obviously the new family that were living in the house were spooked by this letter, but they agreed to stay as long as Derek and Maria put up a load of cameras inside and outside the house. The reason that the family decided to stay, even though they did have that clause in the contract, was because the Watcher didn't seem mad at them for living in the house. The Watcher still seemed mad at Derek and Maria, the couple that never even moved in. Two and a half years ago, they had bought this house and for some reason, the Watcher has a personal vendetta against them. The letter ended with basically a direct threat to Derek and Maria. It said, maybe a car accident, maybe a fire, maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away, but makes you feel sick day after day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet, loved ones suddenly die, planes and cars and bicycles crash, bones break. Like what the actual F? Like that is so scary. The way that the Watcher threatens things is so creepy. It's so cryptic because they never just outright say anything. They never say, I'm gonna kidnap your kids or I'm gonna hurt you, I'm gonna kill you. It's always like, it's between the lines of what they're saying. They're being so vague, but still making a threat that something bad is gonna happen, but they're keeping it so open-ended uh, to cause a lot more anxiety, I presume. It could be anything. They could get the family in any way. They need to be careful at all times. Maybe a car accident, maybe a fire, planes and cars and bicycles crash. It's so scary. On Christmas Eve of 2017, over a year since the last letter from the Watcher, a bunch of families in Westfield received a white envelope in the mailbox. And it actually just so happened that the select families that had received these envelopes happened to be the families that were the most critical or the least sympathetic of the broadest family when they were going through all of this. Again, the letters in these envelopes were typed, so there was no like handwriting clues. And they were all signed, not with the watcher, but with friends of the broadest family. And the vibe of these letters, while the content was different, the vibe of these letters was very similar to the Watcher letters. It had like this sinister, almost like condescending, creepy vibe. But these letters were not about 657 Boulevard. Well, they were. <laughs> these letters were more so to accuse all these different families of speculating false narratives about 657 and the Broadus family. Because like I said, these families were the ones that were chatting the most shit about the Broaduses, I guess. But it turned out that the person behind all of these letters was actually Derek Broadus himself. His paranoia over the years made him so obsessed with the Watcher. And he was so upset with how his neighbors had like handled the whole thing and how they'd treated them to the point where he wanted to freak them out the way that they had been all these years ago. He had become just like the, the threatening stalker that he hated so much. The, the person that had put his family through so much and, and now he was stooping to that level. He was making other families feel like that. But he wasn't proud of what he had done. He ended up confessing to his wife, Maria, and he swore that those were the only anonymous letters that he'd ever written. He swore that he wasn't behind the watcher letters. He just wanted to make them feel how they had made him feel. Derek says that the house is, quote, like cancer, and they still think about it every day. In 2019, 657 Boulevard was finally sold, but at a $400,000 loss. The new owners of the house have not received a single letter from the watcher or from any anonymous creepy stalker. They have been absolutely fine living there. The Broaders family eventually bought another house on the other side of Westfield and they've never been bothered again by the watcher either. And it appears as though the watcher has given up with 657 Boulevard. Or have they? I guess only time will tell. So 
What do you guys think? I don't know what I think, but I'm suspicious of the neighbors. I think it was, guys, this is my opinion. This is all my opinion. It's all alleged. I think the neighbors were all doing it together though. I'm not gonna lie. Cause the letters were so pissed off about like the renovations and how things were changing around here. And the way that they all rallied up together in the board meeting, one of them brought a fucking lawyer. Why do you care what other people are gonna do with their plot of land and their house? Why do you care that it's gonna be made into two houses? I don't know, that's just my own personal theory. My own personal theory. What do you guys think? I think it could have also just been a prank as well. I don't know. Whether the letters are like real or just a joke, they scared me shitless regardless. Like I have had to like do this work with the lights all on. I had to have someone else in the room. Like I've had to turn it off so many times because I've been like, what do you mean? There's something in the walls. But yeah, let me know what you guys think down below. I would love to hear your theories and who you think could have been sending those letters. Do you think we'll ever know? Thanks again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this Freaky Friday episode. Remember, they're giving you guys a special offer when you go through the link down below in the description of my video. I love them so much and I know that you guys will too. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. It means a lot to me. I, I'm really loving the response to the Freaky Friday series from you guys. You seem to be very receptive to it, which I'm very grateful for. I've wanted to cover different random shit for ages, but I've always been too scared to. I didn't want to piss anyone off, but I'm having so much fun and I hope you guys are too. If you want to watch another one of my videos, there should be one on screen right now. You can just click on it or you can click the little circle with my face in to subscribe to my channel. We post Freaky Friday videos every other Friday and and true crime in between that. So with that being said, I'll see you next week for a true crime episode. Bye.